There is little left, unwritten or unsaid, about the steam locomotive, but we try anyway. They were simple machines on complex frames. They were iron horses. They were coats, thoroughbreds. They were the fastest thing on land. They were the sound of progress and in industry, adventure and loss. They had colorful names, Hudson's, Northern's, Mountains, and Berkshire's. What's going on everybody, Future Out Productions here. We're back with another review, and this time it's the brand new three rail, semi-scale, Lion Chief 2.0, Nickel Plate Road number 765. Before we get started on this review, I want to go over a little bit of the history of the 765. But I know how passionate some people can be about this engine, so I'm just going to do the basic history. If you want to learn more about the 765 and its backstory, I recommend picking up the documentary Listen for the Whistle, which you can buy from the Fort Wayne Railroad Historical Society's gift store. I will put a link in the description. Nickel Plate Road 765 is a 284 Berkshire type steam locomotive built for the New York, Chicago, and St. Louis Railroad, commonly referred to as the Nickel Plate Road, in 1944 by the Lima Locomotive Works in Lima, Ohio. Classified as an S2 class Berkshire, the locomotive operated fast, heavy freight and passenger trains until retirement in 1958. It is also similar in design to Pierre Marquette No. 1225, also built by Lima. 765 was first assigned to Bellevue, Ohio, where it was used primarily on the nickel plates fast freight trains. After World War II, the locomotive worked primarily out of a classification yard in the east side of Fort Wayne, Indiana. Its final revenue run came on June 14, 1958, and when 765 was activated to supply steam heat to a stranded passenger train that December, it became the last nickel plate road Berkshire under steam. Now you're probably wondering how 765 is around still today. Well, in order to do that, we have to look at her younger sister, 767. And to do that, here is a clip from the documentary, Listen for the Whistle. On October of 1955, the overpass was declared open and a Berkshire, number 767, broke the ceremonial ribbon. Unencumbered by traffic jams, the north side of the city blossomed. Signs on the elevation ridge. Fort Wayne and the Nickel Plate, working together for progress. But by 1958, progress had a different name for the Nickel Plate Road. It was the internal combustion engine. The last steam-powered passenger train was June 11, 1958, pulled by Berkshire, numbered 765. Though the Berkshires had competed with encroaching diesel electric technology, they were largely retired by 1958 and kept in stored serviceable condition by the railroad. Traffic reduction and the acquisition of new diesel locomotives would keep the locomotives mothballed, stored outdoors, and scrapped by 1964. However, due to its mechanical condition and favorable reputation among local crews, Nickel Plate maintained the 765 indoors until 1961. In a move to honor the success of Fort Wayne's Elevate the Nickel Plate project, the city requested number 767 for display in Lawton Park in recognition of it being the first ceremonial train to open the overpass. However, due to storage outdoors after 1957, 767 proved to be in a deteriorated condition. So what did the railroad do? They switched the numbers. 765 became 767 and 767 became 765. 767 was scrapped sometime in the 60s in Chicago, and 765 entered a quiet life sitting in Lawton Park, and that's where the next chapter of her story comes into play. In September of 1971, at the annual convention of the Nickel Plate Historical and Technical Society, Wayne York, Glenn Brendel, and Walter Sassmanhausen Jr. met to discuss forming a group to cosmetically restore Nickel Plate Road 765 which at the time was still labeled as 767. By November of 1972, York, Brendel, Sassmanhausen, and John Itchman signed incorporation papers for the Fort Wayne Railroad Historical Society, Inc. By 1973, they undertook a 25-year lease of the 765 and in 1974 moved the engine to New Haven, Indiana to begin what was now a restoration to operation. 
On October 25th, the locomotive returned to its original number and restoration officially began. From 1975 to 1979, 765 was restored to operating condition at the corner of Ryan and Edgerton Roads in New Haven. The restoration site lacked conventional shop facilities and protection from the elements, but on September 1, 1979, the 765 made its first move under its own power. <laughs> Winter, it ran under its own power to Bellevue and Sandusky, Ohio for heated indoor winter storage. In the spring of 1980, 765 underwent a series of break-in runs and its first public excursion, making 765 the first mainline steam locomotive to be restored and operated by an all-volunteer nonprofit. From 1980 to 1993, 765 successfully operated over several Class 1 railroads in the Midwest and East Coast including Conrail, CSX, and Norfolk Southern. However, by that time, the locomotive had accumulated 115,000 miles since its last major overhaul by the Nickel Plate Road, 52,000 of which were incurred during its excursion career alone. The locomotive had developed signs of wear and was originally slated for a running gear overhaul upon completion of the excursion season that year. Between 1993 and 2001, 765 was largely a static exhibit until a complete overhaul was commenced. In the meantime, the Fort Wayne Railroad Historical Society operated Milwaukee Road 261 and restored CNO 2716, the same locomotive which had developed firebox problems while on the Southern Railway under lease from the Kentucky Railway Museum. After initial operations in 1996, 2716 required new tubes and flues per newly enacted Federal Railroad Administration regulations. At the time, the Railroad Historical Society decided that it would fully invest its resources into a complete overhaul of 765. Over a period of five years, 765 was completely disassembled with its boiler, frame, and running gear separated and major components remachined or rebuilt completely. In July of 2005, 765 underwent a successful steam test and was later rolled out the following October for the general public. From 2009 to 2011, 765 largely operated passenger excursions, photo chargers, and public events on regional and short-line railroads. In 2012, Norfolk Southern leased 765 to operate a series of employee appreciation specials in Ohio, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and Missouri to mark the company's 30th anniversary. The following year, 765 was officially included in Norfolk Southern's 21st Century Steam Program, an effort to engage the general public and celebrate the railroad's heritage through steam locomotive operations. The 765 would operate in the 21st Century Steam Program from 2013 to 2015 when the program came to an end. Today, the 765 is headquartered in New Haven, Indiana at the Fort Wayne Railroad Historical Society's new shop. Now that you know the history of the 765, let's talk about this model. On the front of the engine, we have the brand new design pilot, and it's actually very prototypical to the real thing. And above that, we have a nice crisp 765. Moving up from the pilot, you can see that we have the headlight and the number 765 on the side, as well as on the front here, as I mentioned earlier. And above that, we have the marker lights, which illuminate green when the engine is in operation. However, there are no flying number boards. I'm planning on getting some die cast reproductions of them and actually attaching them to the model. Moving up from the headlight, we have the bell. And now the bell here is not exactly prototypical. The real life bell actually is powered by air and the clapper will actually hit the side of the bell just by the power of air, not just you know the motion of it swinging back and forth. Moving up from the bell, we have the feed water heater and the smokestack. And to load fluid into the smoke unit, which is on the inside of the locomotive, you simply pour it straight down the stack. Moving on from the smoke stack, you can see the steam dome here, and then the sand dome, along with the lettering on the side of the sand dome, NYC and STL for New York, Chicago, and St. Louis, 
otherwise known as the nickel plate road. Moving down into the side of the engine, we have the cab and the firebox, and on the cab we have a nice crisp 765. Inside the cab, we have two hand-painted crew figures, an engineer and a fireman. We also have a flickering light inside the firebox for the flickering firebox effect, and there's also a cab light that turns off when the engine starts moving. Below the cab, we have the receiving socket for the draw bar that allows the electronics in the engine to communicate with the electronics in the tender. Along the side of the engine, you can see some nicely externally applied handrails. Now, according to the instruction manual, these are isolated from the die cast metal body um, because apparently they help with the IR signal that allows the remotes and the Bluetooth app to connect to the engine in order for it to run. So these locomotives need to be handled with extreme care in order for it to actually work properly. So try not to bend the handrails or anything like that. These are very important. Now that we reviewed the engine, let's review the tender. On the front of the tender, we have the other part of the draw bar that allows the electronics in the engine to communicate with the electronics in the tender. Moving to the side of the tender, we can see the trucks here. Now, the trucks are not prototypical to the 765. 765's tender trucks are actually three axled and not two axled like the model here. But I understand why Lionel did it. It's definitely cheaper to produce two axles per truck than it is three axles per truck. Moving up from the trucks, we have a crisp nickel plate road as well as the road's initials right here. And then we have a coal load on top. It's all die cast metal. Moving to the top of the tender, we have some externally applied handrails here along with a crisp 765 as well as the amount of water and the amount of coal the tender can hold and below that we have the electrocoupler that can be fired from the Bluetooth app, the Legacy or the TMCC remote or the Universal remote. On the underside of the engine we have two pickup rollers, one here and one here and on the underside of the tender we have two pickup rollers, one per truck. Now it's time for BFIMO, best feature in my opinion. Well, this engine has a bunch of great features. The fact that it has some good detail and the fact you can run it with your TMCC remote or your legacy remote is a bonus. But I have to give credit where credit is due, and I have to say the sound package is the best feature of this locomotive. I mean, the whistle on this sounds so much like the real thing, it's not even funny. Like, it brings back so many memories of riding behind this locomotive back in 2018 for the Joliet Rocket. Like the last trip of the last event of the, you know, last time they did it. And I've heard this whistle so many times in my dreams and in my memories that hearing it in model form just takes me back to all those good memories I made. And I even get to see the engine again next month for the Pumpkin Train Festival. I mean, that is probably one of the highlights of my year so far. And, like... The best part is I actually get to drive the engine. I signed up for throttle time. So I get to drive this engine in real life, and I am so excited to do it. Well, let's go ahead and start the engine up. As you can see, there's the light in the cab when the engine is not moving. Now, as you can see, we have track power, but we don't have control over the locomotive yet. Now, normally you would use the Bluetooth app or the Lionel Legacy remote with the TMC sitting on it, but since I don't have the Legacy remote and I don't want to use the Bluetooth app, we're going to use the Lionel Universal remote. So we go ahead and turn it on. I have the engine programmed as Engine 1, so I'm going to click that. And so now it's connected. Okay, let's go ahead and try the whistle. All right, here's the bell. And here's the infamous crew talk. Dispatcher, air is made, brake test complete. Are we clear to pull? Over. Hold your position, out. Dispatcher, ready to roll. Can I pull? Over. You're good to go, out. Okay, let's go ahead and move her on out. Dispatcher, ready to roll.
that's it for this review. I hope you guys enjoyed. This engine is a bunch of fun to run. The details are amazing. The sound package is amazing. And I can't even begin to describe how good the sound package is. It's so good. If you're interested in picking one of these up, the retail price is $499.99, but if you go through a good Lionel dealer, you could probably get a little bit of a discount. And for $30 more, $429.99, you could get the Polar Express version or the Disney version. So it really depends on what you can afford. If you want the Polar Express version, I recommend getting it, but I like the 765 model, so it's more of a personal preference. I'll put a list of the available liveries down in the description. If you're interested in learning more about the 765 and the Fort Wayne Railroad Historical Society, there's a link down in the description that will take you to their page. And if you're interested in donating to the society, there'll be the donation link here or in the description down below. And, you know, feel free to donate if you can. These guys really could use the money right now with the pandemic going on. In fact, all tourist railroads could use the money right now to keep going, to keep preserving and making railroad history. So if you can, please donate. I will put some lit links to some railroad museums that are around the country that could really use you know, your help. So if you're interested in donating, those links will be there. But uh, I will leave you now with some words from a crew member of, of the 765 about the 765. So until next time, I'm Future Rail Productions signing off. George Santiano was a history professor at uh, Harvard in like 1900. He said, we must welcome the future, realizing that soon it'll be the past. And we must respect the past, knowing that once it was all that was humanly possible. If the people that see what we do, if they see this train come by, if they somehow get the perspective that there's something from the past that in its day was the height of technology. It, in its day, it was the space shuttle. It was all that was humanly possible.